I'm Van B. Francisco with this segment of Lessons for Entrepreneurs, and I'm speaking with Frank Adante. He's the CEO and founder of Rubicon Project. Frank, thanks for joining us. Thanks for having me. Frank, you have been, um, you've started a five companies, so you've had a, a, a long history um, at such a young age of starting companies, and collectively, collectively you've raised $200 million, um, so that's pretty impressive, and, uh, and I'm certain that you have a lot of lessons to share from your from your, your first company to today. So be- before we even get into the lessons, why don't you just talk a little bit about your first company that you started um, back in, was it high school or college? college. And just, uh, yeah. just run down the companies that you've started, the five of them. Sure, so of the five, uh, two were acquired. Uh, took one public, uh, one failed in 2001. It was a wireless company. Okay. Uh, I like to refer to that as a learning experience. We thought it was the time for wireless in 2001, but yeah, it was we, a little too early. We did. It was about five years too early. Uh, and then my last company was a company called Strongmail Systems, uh, which is here in Silicon Valley. Uh, started in Los Angeles. It's a Sequoia Capital-backed company. We raised about $30 million. It's the leading email delivery infrastructure provider. Um, so the first company I started was uh, one of the first search engines on the internet. It was mm-hmm. called Starting Point. Mm-hmm. Uh, we were number seven on the top ten list. Mm-hmm. Uh, Microsoft was number eight. Mm-hmm. So this was back in 97, 98. Uh, good times for the internet. Um, the way that we looked at making money was through advertising. So that's where I sort of you know, got my feet wet in the advertising space. Uh, we ultimately ended up selling that company to CMGI. Mm-hmm. Uh, and that inspired me to uh, go and start one of the first ad networks and one of the first ad servers on the internet, which was called L90. Uh, the product was called Ad, remember ad that Monitor. Company. Yeah. Yeah. I remember it. I remember covering <laughs> it. And that's the one that went public. Yeah, that's the one that okay. went public. Uh, we competed with DoubleClick. Uh, okay. DoubleClick was the big 800-pound gorilla mm. in the space. Uh, we were going after them. Uh, we ultimately became the number two player in the space okay. behind them. Uh, we started with no venture capital. Uh, you know, we didn't really have you know, this, this big vision of building this big company. Okay. And next thing you know, we had 3,000 customers. We delivered ads to 65% of the Internet. Um, you know, became the number two player in the space behind DoubleClick. Uh, took the company public. Mm-hmm. Uh, we raised about $112 million in our IPO. Uh, reached a market cap of about $600 million. This and was then, back in the heyday, right? Yeah, well, this was back in 2001. Yeah. Uh, we actually went public on the first day, uh, or the first stock market crash. Oh. <laughs> It was good times. Yeah, it was good timing. <laughs> yeah, but it still worked out well. I mean, we had a good business. Uh, we were generating revenue. Yeah. Uh, the company was growing fast. Uh, we focused on premium advertisers. Yeah. It's a lot of the brick and mortar yeah. tech companies. So that's why the company was able to sort of survive the, the downturn. So, I mean, it sounds like you had a failure in there, mm-hmm. starting a company. So any lessons from starting a company, you know, well before its time? And how do you how do you know if you're doing that again, or how do you not put yourself in that type of situation again? And maybe there's a there's a lesson to be learned there. Yeah, you know, there's a few things. Um, I'd say one is timing is critical. Like we hear that all the time. Mm-hmm. You know, it's not just having a great idea. It's not mm-hmm. just having a, a big market opportunity, but making sure that it's the right timing in the market. Mm-hmm. You don't want to be too late because mm-hmm. that means that market's going to be crowded. Uh, you also don't want to be too early because that means that you're going to burn a lot of capital waiting for the market to catch up. Right. Right. So you kind of want to catch it you know, right before the market's sure. going to take off, which is so Investors hard to Investors love predict, to do that, right? too. Yeah, of course. <laughs> right before you really take off. Yeah, if we all had that formula, then yeah. this would be a whole lot easier than... than so then is. what about your other, maybe in terms of competing with the big guys? You mentioned Microsoft, the DoubleClick, maybe any lessons in sort of competing? Or do you, do you not really try to throw all the money against it and try to compete against big guys, but just play your own game? Or I don't know. I don't want to speak for you. So what, what are... So maybe just... Share, share three le- three big pieces of advice besides the timing one. You know, focus on customers. That's critical. I think okay. so many companies and entrepreneurs focus on competition. Okay. And when you're an early stage company in a big market, mm-hmm. focusing on competition could steer you the wrong way. Yeah. So I'm a big fan on listen to your customers, uh, you know, figure out where their pains are, yeah. uh, figure out how you can provide aspirin to them, not vitamins. <laughs> right? Because if someone has pain, they're more likely to buy your product. Uh, I think a, a great lesson to learn from is the airline industry. If you look at American Airlines and United Airlines, they were focused on the wrong competitor. They are focused on each other. Right? Hmm. And those airlines are constantly on the verge of bankruptcy. Hmm. What happened was Southwest and JetBlue came in with new efficient models, right. and they're killing them. Right? Right, right, right. So I think that's a you know, perfect 
yeah, that's less great, to go look at. And so, right. you know, if you focus on, on the competition sometimes, you could be missing out on, on the real market opportunities. Who are the United Airlines and uh, American Airlines of the tech industry <laughs> today? Um, well, let's, any other lessons from just um, fundraising since you raised $200 million? I mean, is there any, are you, you've already raised $20 million for Rubicon projects, so clearly you don't mind raising money. I just talked to somebody over at, uh, he just founded Social Media and, and Jason Goldberg, he mm -hmm. said, I raised $50 million for Jobster and I raised half a million for um, for Social Media. And so he's not, he's in the camp of don't raise a lot of money, but you're in the camp of, okay. Well, there's, Money's good. there's a difference between find out and roll out. So I'm not a big fan of raising a lot of money for the find out stage, mm -hmm. you know, figuring out if the business model actually really works. Yeah. Uh, but I am, if if it's all about the rollout and scaling the business fast. Right? Okay. If you've figured out the formula, I think raising money in that case could be mm -hmm. a good strategy. Uh, great example is I told you about my first company, Starting Point. Uh, we were one of the most popular search engines on the, uh, on the internet. Right? Mm -hmm. This was pre-Google. Uh, we competed with Yahoo, mm -hmm. and we didn't raise money. I didn't know what venture capital was. Mm -hmm. you know, had we raised money, <laughs> we could have been Yahoo or Google. I mean, we had a you know, fine outcome. Or you've been really foolish. <laughs> well, we could have been foolishly. It's true. It's true. You've been an entrepreneur for a long time. I can imagine that maybe your character has changed between since the time you were first an entrepreneur to today. Mm -hmm. So can you talk about just... Uh, one or two things that's different about you and how you approach entrepreneurship today versus how you did it when you first started? Yeah, sure. So when I first started, I didn't even consider myself an entrepreneur. Uh, I probably couldn't even, even you know, told you what that word meant. <laughs> um, yeah, I was just doing something that was fun, uh, building stuff. Yeah, it was right. something that really got me energized. And then there was sort of a period in my life, yeah, I'd say probably four or five years ago, where people were actually labeling me an entrepreneur. Right? And after a few successes, people yeah. all of a sudden had expectations yeah. of me. So I was like, hmm, like, you know, maybe I need to do stuff by the book. Okay. You know, maybe I need to go hire people based on their resumes rather than gut feeling. Uh, maybe I need to go you know, market and you know, productize uh, the, the technology a, you know, a certain way because that's how it's supposed to be done. Right. And I started you know, doing things by the, the book, you know, the other. Yeah, yeah, book, sure. Book, right, that doesn't exist. Um, instead of leading with my gut, and I found myself getting you know, really insecure about the way that I was leading the business. Mm. And it was something I never really thought about because you know when you're younger, you just don't think about this kind of stuff. Um, so finally, one day, I was like, wait a second, like I just don't feel good about the way that I'm running these businesses or this, this particular business, and just. You know, completely flip things around. I said, you know, I'm just gonna start leading with my gut, you know, going back to going back you know, the way to I feel like things should be. Hmm. Um, and it was amazing. Like the the business was you know, taking off after that. And you know, since then, I've re realized that it's it requires a certain discipline to behave that way as you get older. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's you know, like a kid just jumping into a pool. Right. Right. <laughs> Uh, you know, you do that like when you're a kid, but like you know, now, like you're like, is the is the water cold? Like you think about things. So leading with your gut and not thinking about things sometimes can be a right. challenge. Right. Be open-minded. Think like a child. Yeah. 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 Sometimes you do. And right. Be open to taking risks. If you're truly an entrepreneur, I think leading with your gut is a is a breaking a piece. few bones. Yeah. That's a good one. That's definitely a good one to keep in mind. I think that as you get older, you just definitely get to feel that you have to be mature. Mm -hmm. and not take so many risks and um, I, I guess look at Steve Jobs he's probably doing a lot of gut checks and thinking this is the way I'm going to pursue something and going, going for it in that direction mm -hmm. so anyway well you seem to be doing a great job following your gut so thank you for sharing I've been thank speaking you. with Frank Adante he's the CEO and founder of Rubicon Project I'm Bambi Francisco